On a warm morning in September, five Canadian diplomats quietly left their station in Tehran. A world away, Canada formally expelled all Iranian diplomats from Ottawa. After years of mounting tensions, official ties had crumbled. With the latest Canadian decision to suspend diplomatic relations with Iran, we are now effectively out of the game. However, in the internet age, new avenues of diplomacy are emerging. Digital diplomacy initiatives often sit in opposition to other state foreign policies and tactics, such as the growing surveillance state. As state citizens become global citizens through digital access to information, and state actors struggle to wield this new tool effectively and with integrity, Will traditional diplomacy be unbound? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of the CG Signature Lecture Series. Thanks also to all of you for joining us at this event, whether you're here at the CG Auditorium or if you're joining us through our live webcast. Following this evening's address, we welcome questions from both audiences uh, here at the microphones at the bottom of the aisles or through the live chat function of your screen if you're watching at home. Please remember to state your name and to keep your questions brief. Now, I assume you've all turned your cell phones off uh, because we're all experiencing fewer moments in our everyday lives that are not interrupted by the ping of our smartphones, whether it's a text, an email, a tweet, a post, or a share. But the digital age is changing, and some would even say disrupting, far more than our simple daily routines. Tonight, digital media expert and newest member of CG's Board of Directors, Taylor Owen, will discuss the crisis of the state occurring amid advances in technology. And here to more properly introduce tonight's speaker is CG Research Fellow Eric Jardine, who's a key member and contributor to CG's research initiative on internet governance. Please join me in welcoming Eric Jardine. Good evening, everyone. So it is my distinct pleasure this evening to uh, introduce Dr. Taylor Owen. Dr. Owen is an expert on social media, digital technology, and international affairs, and he is an assistant professor of digital media and global affairs at the University of British Columbia, and the director of the International Relations and Digital Technology Project. He is the founder and editor-in-chief of opencanada.org, which is an award-winning international affairs website and one of Canada's best sources for news and commentary on Canadian foreign policy and international relations. Throughout his rather accomplished career, Dr. Owen has been the recipient of numerous awards, including a prestigious Trudeau scholarship, which he held at Oxford University, and a Banting postdoctoral fellowship, which he held at the University of British Columbia. Closer to home, as Fred mentioned earlier, Dr. Cohen, Dr. Owen is now the newest member of the CG Board of Directors. Now, CG's core mandate is the dissemination of research and ideas, both to policymakers and to the general public. Here, there, are, there, there is, I think, a natural synergy between Dr. Owen's expertise in digital media, his role with OpenCanada.org, and our core organizational mandate. So on behalf of everyone at CG, I want to welcome Dr. Owen to the CG board, and I hope we have a long and productive relationship. Dr. Owen is a truly accomplished writer, and I won't list all of his books and articles here, but I would like to commend his newest book to you, Disruptive Power, The Crisis in the State in the Digital Age. It happens to be the basis for the talk this evening, but just one talk, even one delivered by the author himself, cannot really do justice to the many interesting issues and ideas about the impact of technology on governments and politics that are raised in this book. You simply, I think, have to read the book for yourselves. In the meantime, uh, without further ado, let me please welcome Dr. Taylor Owen. Thank you so much, and it's, it's a real honor to be here, and I'm so um, sort of excited to join the CG community. I've been ad admiring the organization from afar for many years now in Canada, and it's, it's exciting to be able to participate somehow in it. Um, 
So what I, wa I want to talk a little bit about the, the core um, project that this book represents for me, which is exploring the nature of technology in the international affairs system. And this is, of course, a vast, broad topic that's filled with all sorts of rhetoric um, uh, but, and some scholarship, but not a ton of sort of people stepping back and saying, okay, on, in, in total, what is the impact of technology on different spaces of international affairs? And so, so how I want to do that today is, is tell three stories or provide three narratives that I think give us different windows into this relationship between technology and power, um, and quite different windows, um, and then draw some of the implications of those off um, for this, that I think the implications of these for states and for other um, hierarchical institutions. So the first narrative is uh, what I would call liberation technology. So this is the idea that technology has an emancipatory power, that otherwise disenfranchised groups can use technologies to push back against established powers. And, and a good place to start here, of course, is, is the Arab Spring. So as is widely known, on January 28, 2001, in the middle of a popular uprising that was organized and amplified online, the Mubarak regime turned off the internet. This is what it looked like. This was the internet traffic the day before and day after. This display of state power was a stark reminder that digital technology remains highly susceptible to state control. What is less known about this narrative, though, is, is how the internet was turned back on, or how digital communications were re-enabled. Spread around the world, members of a group called Telecomics, a decentralized network of mostly Western hackers and activists, committed to, the free, to freedom of expression. Um, they call themselves a decentralized security service. Uh, began figuring out how to reestablish network connections in Cairo. They partnered with a hacker-friendly French internet service to set up hundreds of dial-up modems around the city. They worked with amateur radio enthusiasts, enthusiasts to send logistical messages over shortwave radios. They, they sent leaflets to fax machines based in, on campuses and cyber cafes and businesses around the city. And they used those same fax machines and additional ones set up to allow people to send messages out to people receiving the faxes else other, in other parts of the world who would then post the messages to Twitter. When countries block, we devolve, said Telecomics member Peter Fain, who's become sort of a spokesperson for the group. We're motivated by a radical passion for freedom and drawn together by the desire to have an internet, internet adventure to see what free communication can do in the lives of ordinary people. So filled with activist revolutionary zeal, right, on the potential of technology. As the Arab Spring spread, though, the tactics of both the revolutions and the autocrats got more sophisticated, as is sort of a well known, is well, very well known. Instead of shutting down the internet in Syria, Assad used it as a source of intelligence. So Telecomica's role shifted from guerrilla IT support, which they were doing in Egypt, to surveillance circumvention trainer in, Egypt, in Syria. They crawled the internet in Syria and various internet devices um, for as many Syrian email addresses as they could and sent them circumvention tools. And this message went out to, to, to tens of thousands of email addresses. A Telecomics a hacker called the operation a combination of high technical skill, deep emotional involvement, and decentralized technological power. What is most interesting to me, though, is not this sort of one example of a, tech, of a technologically enabled actor inside these movements, but really that they were part of a vast network of these. Telecomic says that the difference between them and Anonymous, they're actually similar in many ways, they share some of the, many of the same characteristics, um, is that, um, is that uh, where Anonymous destroys, we build. So Anonymous was also in the Arab Spring, or in countries in the Arab Spring, but they were destroying things. They were taking down the websites of governments, taking down the websites of financial institutions that were supporting the governments. Crisis mappers crowdsourced the analysis of satellite imagery to document Syrian tank movement. And citizens live streamed the ruthless bombing of homes and other atrocities around the country. And amateur experts around the world use these video footages and these photos to identify munitions and track their sources. We can debate the merits and overall impact of these actions, I think. And we know that traditional powers have largely fought back effectively and to brutal consequences, particularly in Egypt and Syria. 
But what is certain to me in looking at these across the space is that these actors form a new layer in the international system, one that does not fit comfortably in our traditional categories and theoretical models. They're not nation states, they're not formal institutions or rogue individuals, like we like to categorize actors in the international space. Instead, they are participants in, a digi in digital networks bound by a set of characteristics that are fundamentally technologically enabled. So this project and this book began as an attempt to understand these new actors, to understand their capabilities and their impact across different spaces of international affairs. So I looked at finance, diplomacy, humanitarianism, journalism, activism, and conflict and war fighting. I wanted to explore the characteristics successful digital actors share, and what, if anything, makes them disruptive to traditional forms of power. There's a lot of scholarly work in any one of these spheres, humanitarianism, diplomacy, trade, um, but it's only when you step back, I think, that you see these common set of attributes across these actors, and I want to talk about a few of them. The first is that these organizations and groups are fundamentally formless. You can't join telecomics because it's not an organization. You can't lead it because there's no leader. You quit anonymous by no longer participating. Users engage almost always in these organizations under a cloak of encryption and pseudonyms. So how are we to understand actors with significant power in the international space, but no institutional structure? The answer, I think, lies in the power that is gained because of, rather than in spite of, their decentralized and non-hierarchical nature. It lies in the character of their formlessness. For example, in these groups, there's no leadership or formal, formal structure. There's a te technologically enabled anonymity, enabled by and based in encryption. Communication and planning are radically decentralized, leading to rapid evolution of form. And the network itself is highly resilient. Nodes of these networks can survive high rates of failure across the network. All of these attributes run in direct contrast to traditional 21st century institutions which gain their authority, capacity, legitimacy, and strength from their hierarchical, hierarchical command and control structures. Think about the United Nations, Ford, the US military, the BBC, the Red Cross. In each of these spaces of the international system, the power is has been traditionally dominated by these command and control systems. Second, these global digital actors and their networks are highly unstable. In a digital network, information, as we know, is both abundant and evolving at an increasingly fast pace. News of world events has become a commodity, and the evolution of ideas, ideologies, beliefs, and politics is happening in real time online. Because of this, the production of new information is outpacing our capacity to understand it as a collective. This is a real problem with how to grasp and for, for traditional institutions um, who need predictable knowledge in order to plan for future events, in order to build their businesses, in order to know the future. So this system privileges fundamentally actors who are nimble and can evolve quickly in this space. Third, these networks are collaborative. We're so used to equating organization with hierarchy that at first it seems surprising that disparate groups and individuals can act collaboratively and collectively. In the international system, a state is defined as sovereign by an external actor in this case, maybe the United Nations. But in a networked model, new actors require no outside party to sustain status. Instead, their identities derive wholly from what they do and the impact that they have. But if the internet, if the internet technologically empowers individuals to act on their own, how does it regulate collective behavior in this system? In a lovely turn of phrase, a theorist named Jenny Sundin says that on the internet, one types oneself into being. What she means is that online, credibility and authority are gained through action rather than representation. That authority is judged only by the reality that the participants create. Perhaps more importantly, however, groups like Anonymous and Telecomics and other actors in these networks um, show, show us that collective action is possible without centralization and hierarchy. And I'll come back to this point at the end because to me it's one of the critical ones. So, so that's the first narrative. That's what I think we get if we look at, we take these actors as positive co contributors to um, the emancipatory role of technology and the potential liberation that can come with it. And we, and we look at the, use that lens to look at these actors and sort of decipher um, what they're good at. The second narrative is what I would call the digital arms race. So if we turn to Syria and to telecomics' role in Syria, 
scanning the Syrian internet for vulnerabilities when they were trying to send out all those emails. Um, Telecomics found a log file that included details of mass surveillance data being collected by the Assad regime, who they were, who they were monitoring, what data they were collecting on people. These data were traced to, traced to a device made by a California company called Blue Coat Systems. The Syrian government was spying on its citizens using a US-made device. This is not entirely surprising. There's a vast global market for surveillance technologies, often purchased at large conferences, where buyers from democratic and autocratic countries alike buy the latest weaponry. One of the main ones is called the wiretapper's ball, and it happens a number of times a year. These are dual use technologies, fundamentally. They can be used to legally monitor a network or to watch an entire population. The Pentagon uses the same blue coat device that Assad was using to monitor the internet activity of its employees. They were found to be using it to block um, access, soldiers from soldiers accessing gay websites through the Pentagon servers. However, unlike other offline dual use technologies, like guns, obviously, um, surveillance devices are more problematic because they engage on and threaten the very foundation of the network itself. They're not used for positive and negative purposes on top of a network. They're actually fundamental to the structure of it itself. At the same time as the Assad regime was cracking down on the revolution in Syria, the same time as all this is happening, Assad's using surveillance to crack down on the regime, the US government was seeking to protect and enable the Free Syrian Army to communicate freely online against surveillance technology using Blue Coat's device. They did so by partnering with the New America Foundation on a project called Commotion Wireless, which sought to develop circumvention technologies and mesh networking tools to allow activists to evade surveillance. This means that the US State Department was providing circumvention tools um, and mesh networking tools, technology that right around the same time, the FBI labeled loudly an indicator of terrorist activity to dissidents who were being targeted by a government armed with digital surveillance tools made in the United States. Meanwhile, the same time as all this is happening, the Syrian Electronic Army, this semi-autonomous group of hackers that are largely funded by the, by the Syrian government, was launching attacks against US interests. So nation states now find themselves in a convoluted position as both enablers and targeters of this type of technologically enabled disruptive action. They're both threatened by digital action and need to leverage its power. This is, I think, is, represents the complexity of power, agency, and control on the internet. And, and until, I mean, quite precisely, the summer of 2013, this tension between the emancipatory power of technology and the ways established powers were using it to reinforce structures of control, which I think is what's happening in this arm race, was the focus of the research for this book. What I didn't know in the first phases of this, which we do now, um, largely thanks to Edward Snowden, was the actual asymmetry of this arms race. So this book, in light of that, and in light of those revelations, also became a study of how democratic states were using technology to fight back against the empowered, and the consequence of a digital arms race between states and their citizens. So this, this brings us to the third story, which I would call algorithmic violence, or the third narrative through which to look at technology and power. Several years ago, I went to a training session for an intelligence analytics software program called Palantir. Um, it was held in a Google-like office in Tyson's Corner, which is sort of the, in DC, which is the center of the military industrial complex in, uh, in, in Washington. Um, in an office that was sort of Google-like office. There were people on scooters and foosball tables and bars, of ener bars full of energy drinks, like full on, it was modeled after a Google office. The company Palantir was founded by this guy, Peter Thiel, who is probably the best known techno-libertarian in Silicon Valley. Um, he's a billionaire, he founded PayPal, was heavily involved in Facebook. Um, and Palantir is a toolkit of data visualization and analytics software that's widely used now by the NSA, the FBI, the CIA, and a whole host of other US national security and policing and domestic policing institutions. Um, so I went to this training program, and as far as I could tell, I was the only civilian in the course, um, which I was taking to see what the research potential, the academic research potential of the software program might be. Because the, the pretense of it is, is very powerful, which I'll talk about. 
Um, Palantir is designed to pull together as much data as possible and then to try to make sense of it. It put, put, fits together all these different types of data analytics software programs, combines them into one package so you can bombard it with all sorts of data and, and it, it brings clarity. Over the course of the day, the Palantir trainer took us through a demonstration investigation. So this is what sort of one of the dashboards of it looks like. Um, we each were at a workstation and we were given a whole host of data sets, um, intel daily intelligence reports from CIA operators, uh, movements of known insurgents, satellite surveillance data, city maps from taken from a daily high resolution um, satellite. These are some of the maps that were created. One by one, we uploaded these data sets into Palantir. So we're given with a new data set and we pumped them into the system. And with each new data set, we were shown a new analytic capability of the program. And in this process, the mythology of Palantir was revealed to us, and it really was a mythology. That with more data comes greater clarity. The more data and big data you pump into the system, the more clarity it will give you over your objective. This is how they position themselves. Make better decisions. In our final exercise, we added information about a movement of a move, the movement of a suspected insurgent in this mythical Middle Eastern city we were studying. And Palantir correlated the location and time of our meeting with a known bomb maker. In real life, the next step would definitely be violent. We would have launched a drone strike or launched a special forces unit. Um, we would have done something to react to this event we had seen, we had predicted using Palantir. Um, but we went home. That was the end of the exercise. We went home, and all the students, most of which were from the U.S. government, went back to their to their departments to sort of share the the power of the software program. So Palantir developed a billion dollar valuation faster than any American company in history, um, largely due to its government security contracts, which, needless to say, is ironic given Teal is this techno libertarian who wants to build. Um, uh, alternative states to take on governments. Um, and the company is now valued between $5 billion and $8 billion. So I tell this story um, because I think it gives us a window into how the state has chosen to treat the digital space and says us a lot about the capabilities they at least aspire to. So I want to talk a bit more about that. I would argue that the state threatened by the increasing power of perceived nefarious digital actors, and I want to make the distinction between actors they perceive as nefarious, actors that they perceive as positive, and actors that may be positive but they perceive as negative, and we can get into those distinctions. Um, to as they claim in documents we now know from the Snowden leaks, collect it all, process it all, exploit it all, partner it all, sniff it all, and know it all which is the collection posture of the NSA. The problem, of course, is that digital omniscience, which I think is what they're aspiring to, is incredibly difficult to accomplish. Even to aspire to it requires two things at the very least. A huge amount of data and the tools to give this huge amount of data meaning. So we know where a lot of this data is coming from now. We didn't know this before, but we now know where a lot of the data sources are. Um, we know our governments are tapping into communication backbones, servers, and transatlantic wire, communication wires. They're sniffing wireless signals in cities and implementing broad online and telecoms data mining activities. This we know. Um, but I would argue that this, the focus on this aspect of surveillance misses the massive new spaces of data, of data collection that are emerging. Um, wide area surveillance tools are capable of recording high resolution imagery of vast areas below them. This is a, a Lockheed Martin blimp. 65 of them were in operation over Afghanistan that provide real time video and audio surveillance across 100 square kilometers at a time. Persistent surveillance systems can record activity taking place in a city below for periods of up to 30 days. This is one of them, the motto of which is persistent security, searching the past, which we'll get to the implications of that in a second. Um, vast networks of cameras in our cities are being compiled in police databases and control centers. Um, this is the, the, ND, the NYPD's real-time uh, crime center where a whole host of big data and surveillance data is coming into a central command center. And of course, Silicon Valley is in on this. 
this is the founder of a company called Planet Labs, which has recently deployed 100 toaster-sized satellites, which will take daily high-resolution images of everywhere on Earth. This is one of the satellites. They call them doves. The goal is to launch 1,000 of them, a persistent, near real-time surveillance tool available to anyone online. You'll be able to download a high-resolution satellite image of anywhere on Earth, first daily when they launch, and then hourly, and then probably um, in real time. Um, this company is funded by Google Ventures. Um, not to belabor this point too much, but driverless Google cars, which are going to be driverless cars in general, are going to be launched quite widely soon, collect two gigabytes of data a second about the world around them. And the Internet of Things is bringing these data collection devices into our homes. Um, you probably heard about the uproar over this new Samsung TV. The Samsung Smart TV came with a warning in its packaging that says that, um, that warned users about discussing personal or other sensitive information in its vicinity, as it could be transferred to a third party. So we're collecting huge amounts of data about the world around us, and this is, this is increasing incrementally, and it's in the business models of the biggest um, technology companies deploying these data collection activities. We know from Palantir, and the lesson from Palantir, is that data isn't enough. We need the tools to give that data meaning. And this is the second piece of, of, the, of the, 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 the equation of algorithmic violence. So to give data meaning, one needs ever complex algorithms, automation, machine learning, and artificial intelligence to make sense of vast stores of data. Such technologies are powering a wide range of new governance tools that can trace and record movements of people, detect patterns, and ascribe risk to behaviors outside of programmed and socially constructed norms. They can also predict future events more and more. Predictive policing has become more and more significant in many cities. They can be also used to kill. This is a, this is a, a robot that guards um, uh, ballistic missile installations in Russia. It can travel at speeds of 45 kilometers an hour and uses radar and laser rangefinders to navigate, analyze potential targets, and fire machine guns without human, uh, without human involvement. Um, this, is a, this is a weapon that sits in the, in the demilitarized zone in between North and South Korea that can lock on a human target up to three kilometers away in the dark and automatically fire a machine gun. The pretense of these capabilities are reserved for war zones. And we hear a lot about robot war and the way these technologies are being deployed inside conflict zones. But I would argue that the pervasive nature of these tools, the fact they're easily deployable and they can collect huge amounts of data from wide, wide populations, combined with the expanding legal mandates of the war on terror, mean that battlefield capabilities in this space are creeping into domestic policing and governance. The, home, the Department of Homeland Security in the U.S., for example, tethered one of those wide area surveillance blimps 2,000 feet above the desert in Nogales, Arizona. Um, this is interestingly, they, they, did, they, in, they, did, they put the surveillance blimp on the, the American, a town on the American side of the border because there's, um, there's uh, uh, relaxed search and seizure laws within a certain distance of the border on either side. So they, they, they interpreted that to mean they could collect data about map wide populations. Um, on the first night of use, the system identified 30 suspects for, for, uh, for um, movement or behavior that was outside of the norm that were brought in for questioning. The consequences, I think, um, of this growing capability of algorithmic governance or algorithmic violence um, are significant, and I want to run through some of them. First, acts of war have become spatially and conceptually boundless. What I mean by this is the once legally established lines between war and peace and between domestic and international engagement are disappearing. Second, digital representation, so the collection of data and the processing data about the world and about people and about our movement, and the biases, values, and ambiguities that are built into these processes 
um, and built into these algorithms, are becoming acts of governance and violence in and of themselves, rather than some simply contributing to them. We are, embedding, we are embedding governance into these algorithms. This is leading us to a place of predictive governance based on unaccountable and unknowable algorithms. One thing about these algorithms is that I mean, even if we were to see the equation because of artificial intelligence and because of constant machine learning on top of these huge databases, these algorithms are largely unknowable even if we were to see the, uh, the equations, um, let alone um, for us to properly analyze the, the biases and subjectivities that are going into building them. Third, I would argue, spaces of dissent in society are being eroded because of this. Those pushing the bounds of what is deemed acceptable behavior in society are increasingly caught within the grasp of algorithms meant to identify deviancy. We're already beginning to see this with significant changes of behavior of investigative journalists in the United States and activists in the United States who are changing their behavior because of this. Finally, the, let alone what's happening to these same communities and countries with far fewer legal controls and oversight. Finally, the combination of widespread surveillance, artificial intelligence, and predictive governance, which I think is the, the confluence of variables we're talking about here, put us on a trajectory towards automated and autonomous war. To me, there's no question that's the direction we're heading. Um, and the result of that, I think, is a, is a significant recentralization re of power. So, I want to step back a little bit. To me, those are three windows into uh, three narratives of this relationship between technology and power. And, and in the progression of them, I think you get to a point where we see that this is leading, that the states are incredibly effective at leveraging this technology to entrench their own interests, to, to fight back against perceived disruptive actors. So, so why, despite of this, despite of this re-centralization of power due to technology, do I think these still, these technologies and the capabilities of that act, these actors represent a crisis for the state? And I wanna talk a bit about that. And I think there's four reasons. The first is that states no longer have a monopoly on the ability to shape the behavior of large numbers of people. Online, collective action is possible without command and control institutions. And this is a fundamental change due to technology. But this has done so without the constraints we have built into the democratic system. So we recognize that being able to make lots of people do lots of things is a, is a, is a substantial power. And so we've built in accountability mechanisms into this. We've built in the rule of law, norms of behavior, international institutions, international legal regimes. All of this to counter this incredible power the state has. But this doesn't exist in decentralized networks. We don't have a check for the power that's emerging. And I think that's a, uh, something we need to, to think through. Second, while governments have all the legacy burdens of other hierarchical 20th century institutions, the lethargy, the waste, the layers of bureaucracy, the slow adaptation, they're not built any differently than those other institutional bureaucracies. Unlike private companies, they can't go bankrupt. They, they can't go away. When Tesla disrupts Ford, we may end up with better cars, but when governments are challenged, we risk losing the collective social goods that they were built to ensure. So disruption theory, which gets touted a lot in this discourse, explains the failure of government institutions to innovate and their high risk of collapse, just as it does for private sector institutions. The same theory applies. But it doesn't account for the social consequences of failure of the state to adapt, for the failure of the state to figure out how to operate and how to transition from an industrial model to a post-industrial model. Third, the attributes and capabilities of digital actors run counter to the norms that give state their power. Groups like Anonymous are empowered, I would argue, by the very problems that the modern state was designed to overcome. A lack of structure, instability, decentralized governance, loose and evolving ties. All of these things were the things that command and control hierarchies are meant to deal with. But these are what empower digital actors. The result then is a misalignment of the norms and institutions that govern the international system, all the institutions we've built up to control the international space, and the mechanisms that increasingly give groups power. There's a, mis there's a disconnect there that's a problem. Finally, and perhaps most critically, what empowers perceived nefarious digital actors is the very same are the very same capabilities that lead to free expression, knowledge creation, and economic development to flourish online. So to put this another way, um, 
there's a, there's a chapter of the book on Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Um, and there, where you see is that the, the very same attributes of Bitcoin or of cryptocurrencies that allow the Zimbabweans to protect their money from hyperinflation, Cypriots to prevent government seizure of bank accounts or migrant workers to send money back to their families at home, also form the bedrock of dark web commerce sites like Silk Road, enable tax evasion and provide a financial system for terrorist groups. These are the same capabilities, they're empowered by the same things. The consequence of this is real, is that in seeking to target these bad actors, the state risks also shutting down all the positive benefits that the internet and digital networks allow. By trying to stop the bad things, the things you have to do to stop those will also stop the good things. And this is a real dilemma that states are in, particularly when their, their national security prerogative or their, promote, their protection of, 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 of the security of their citizens will, will generally trump, um, possibly trump the perceived benefits that they'll be negating. Even worse, as Yokai Benkler states, Fighting against this tide will put governments at odds with some of the most energetic and wired segments of our society. This has real policy consequences. Any society that commits itself to eliminating what makes anonymous possible, he says, and powerful, possible and powerful, risks losing the openness and uncertainty that have made the internet home to so much innovation, expression, and creativity. These are two sides of the same capability. In seeking to control then, the state risks breaking the network itself. So where does this leave governments? And I want to end just by talking a bit about what governments could, can, I think governments can do potentially in this space, uh, do differently in this space. Um, I think generally they're in a tough position. Like uh, we know that when faced with a similar dilemma, large established companies that we never thought would go away have gone away. Um, we know that's not an option for states, so there has to be a different, different engagement. and. Um, a different level of engagement. And I think there are a few things states could do to shift the perception of their engagement in the space or to show that they're willing to engage in the space in a different way. The first is that states um, should seek to protect the network itself at all costs. This means, first and foremost, scaling back the rapidly growing surveillance state and rethinking actions that they're taking that threaten the very capability of the online system. Um, I would put it first and foremost at this, efforts to break encryption that we know are going on um, in, in Western governments. It means having a serious conversation about the power and accountability of algorithms, um, and machine learning, and the artificial intelligence tools that are being deployed, developed, and built by state and corporate actors. I don't think we've had a serious conversation about the capabilities of these um, and where the, the path this takes us down. It also means addressing dual-use technologies seriously, which I don't think we've seen. In the production, sale, and global develop deployment of surveillance tools, the state risks negating many of the positive steps that might otherwise be taking both online and off. And, and I would stress the online ones. The state's doing all sorts of positive things online. But ultimately, I think these are negated by the, by the, by the widespread use, sale, and use of these surveillance tools um, by governments that might be using them for, for far less legitimate means than ours. Second, I think states should engage with digital actors as allies rather than as subjects to be governed. This will first and foremost require rethinking of our approach to online governance. Rather than seeking online governance as a way of regulating private actors, which is traditionally how governance, the governance conversation is structured, states must come to terms with the fact that these new actors are not only self-regulating, um, and perhaps they're beyond regulation itself, they're beyond governance but are also key to the delivery of individual rights and freedoms that are the bedrock of the state's motivation and, and responsibility in the international system. As we have seen, elements of state's behavior online are at odds with the social contract underlying democratic societies, and it risks undermining the very legitimacy with which states hold power. Perhaps even more problematic, the status quo governance discourse delegitimizes de many of the emerging actors with real power, and because of this is blind to some of the core challenges of the 21st century. So I think by, by excluding whole swaths of online actors, because some of, their, some of the, the members or groups are, are doing things that are perceived as negative, we're creating sort of an us and them scenario in the international system uh, with legitimate traditional actors on one side and decentralized anonymous possibly or technologically enabled actors on the other. Third, and building on this, and finally, um, rather than simply transitioning state-based institutions um, online 
which I think is a lot of what the conversation about modernizing international institutions is doing. States need to participate in or help facilitate um, a reimagining of the international system. Our current global institutions, as we know, we talked about, were designed, for, designed by, built for, and run by actors who had took power in the 20th century. That's who we invited to the table. We invited the actors who had power. But now, what would an international organization look like that included actors we know have power in the digital world? What would it mean to include elements of anonymous and telecomics, for example, in international organization or process? And I don't think we know, right? Like that's a, that it would be really disorganized and probably wouldn't work out very well. But what would it mean to, to, to engage in that conversation? And there's much to learn from these groups, I would argue. There's wide swaths of scholarship about the way in which their behavior is regulated, the way in which these, these groups act constructively. New forms of ad hoc governance are beginning to merge and creep out of these institutions. Um, the pirate parties, notion of liquid democracy, which they've been rolling out across Europe, or the means through which anonymous act, anonymous actions are mobilized and regulated through, chat, through their anonymous chat rooms are emerging from this, this networked environment. I think we need to learn from these. So instead, ultimately, of seeking control in these networks, I think states should look for ways to scale them and to embed them with the values of the democratic nation state. So I'll just end with, with what I think is a, is a choice facing governments, and, and then we can talk more about any of this. Um, I think there remains an alternate temptation, though, um, that I think may be determinative, or we may be, there may be a path dependency um, to, this, to this outcome. Um, ultimately, if the state is willing to make the digital space a battlefield, to view the digital space as something that can be controlled, it has immense power to do so, as we've seen. And I would say a growing power to do so. But this comes at real cost to the long-term viability of the network world and to all of its social and economic benefits that we know. It also, I would argue, represents a view of the Westphalian social contract, of the state social contract, that threatens to undermine the legitimacy of the state itself. The legitimacy on which the state gets its power, which we, the legitimacy on which we give the state its power. Providing security through predatory means, which much of this is, I think, leveraging the comparative advantage the state has over its citizenry, breaks the bargain on which we give the state its power and authority. So ultimately then, I think this, this, the states face this choice, and it's a difficult one. Um, they can continue on a path of seeking more and more control, compromising both the digital system as well as the principles of democratic governance in which they derive their legitimacy. Or they can accept a higher degree of uncertainty in this digital space, give up some power in order to preserve or, be a construct, or at least be a constructive participant in what I think is an emerging international architecture. So I'll leave it at that for now, and I'm happy to, happy to chat more about any of this. Thanks. <laughs> so I've been told to moderate these questions myself, which means I am very vulnerable, so we can, uh, but uh, there's questions online and that I'm seeing here, and then I think there's two microphones here, so we can use those to open up a conversation. Um, this is a, a question here I guess I'll start with, hope it'll come up, is that should private organizations be held more accountable for their use and abuse of these technologies? I mean, Yes, is the short answer, but it depends on which private c corporations we're talking about. There's so many corporations that are, that are involved in various aspects of the internet. I mean, that's what, what fuels it. Um, there's some, there's some low-hanging fruit there. I don't think we should be um, supporting the development of surveillance technologies and allowing them to be used by autocratic governments abroad, right? Like, that to me is a very easy thing to stop, and we're seeing all sorts of efforts to do that. Um, probably not sufficient, um, but we're seeing efforts to do that. Um, the other piece of this, though, which is more problematic and is more difficult to engage with, is the ways in which um, large technology companies um, have, have built the infrastructure on which a lot of this, um, this both surveillance and I would argue increasingly governance is occurring. Um, the, the, we know that 
that the reason there's so much data available about our behavior is because we've entered into a bargain with large Silicon Valley companies where we give them access to our data in exchange for services. That's the primary economic value, value proposition at the core of, 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 the, of what, are, what are now the new large Silicon Valley companies, the social companies. And um, that's a problem, that's a challenge if one wants to, to have a system where there's more privacy, where there's less um, government surveillance. Um, and I'm not sure how we're gonna get ourselves out of that. So yes, those sorts of organizations should be accountable, but they can only become accountable by people not using their services, and we, we that, that the chances of that happening are very slim. Um, if given the option, one might want to, to pay for Gmail as opposed to getting it for free, but that's if it was secure, sort of an end-to-end -end encrypted version of Gmail. But we know that's like unlikely to happen because a financial model is based on companies having access to that data. So that's a structural problem at the core of this. So yes, that kind of, I think that, those, that kind of corporate actor needs to be held accountable too, but that's probably by us, not by regulators. Yes, my name is Leslie, and I'm concerned about the law of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. In the financial um, realm, we saw AI-based software sending um, triggers to buy and sell, and people using the same software and seeing wild swings in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Over in your field of study, we have a billion-dollar software company, the same algorithms, using the same databases, being used by complementary or competing governments. It, do you have any concerns about that? Yeah, absolutely, I and mean, competing governments and also um, corporate actors in this space as well, right, who are increasingly providing their own cybersecurity mechanisms, and their, I think one scenario we may see is, is um, instead of governments fighting back with cybersecurity weapons, corporations doing it, right? Google, Google has a huge interest in protecting their servers, and some of them were to attack them, I don't think they would necessarily look to the US government to protect them. They might very well um, deploy their own um, cyber capabilities. Um, but yeah, absolutely, the, the, and it could, like, yes, these algorithms uh, played a role in bringing, de bringing on a financial crisis, um, but they're also driving people being killed, right? We know that. We know that these algorithms are selecting targets that are then being approved by human sources um, in very tangential ways. We know that they're leading to new predictive policing models that are, that are, that are um, facilitating arrests, right? That, so there's very real human consequences to the deployment of these algorithms and, I, and the, these, these computational systems. So I think, and, and they can be incredibly useful. They can be incredibly powerful. The Google search algorithm is an incredible thing. Um, but there's an emerging conversation both in the, in the corporate space and in the sort of free speech uh, space around the power of algorithms. And I think we need to have that same conversation in the security space and the foreign policy space. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your talk this year. I found it quite fascinating and I really enjoyed it immensely. My question has to do with what, the, what you pointed out about the ability of inviting in groups like Anonymous mm -hmm. into the governance structures that we have in place. And I was wondering about your thoughts on the ability of these organizations to scale yeah. to that sort of thing. Because the reason we have representative democracy is I don't want to make a decision every single time yeah. a decision is made. Yeah. And in the chat rooms where Anonymous makes its choices, participation determines yeah. outcomes. Yeah. And so I just wanted you to maybe unpack that a little bit for us. Yeah, I mean, so scale is a tricky word in there, right? Like we're, when we, we're talking about scale is can these can we institutionalize these organizations, right? Can we make them look more like us? And, I'm not, and they won't, right? That's, that won't be the case. We will not create a representative democracy inside these systems. And that's a, that's a real failing of these networks and one we need to get our heads around. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't learn from some of the behaviors, behavioral patterns that are emerging in these. And I think the liquid democracy experiment is a great example of that, right? That's an, a, an explicit attempt to say, what does it mean to try and democratize this type of civic, of online civic engagement. And the result isn't perfect, right? But, it, but it's interesting and is an interesting experiment. So I don't think it will be bringing these actors in and making them part of international institutions, but it's bringing them into the conversation about how we empower people, about how we, where the overlapping interests are, where are the interests in, in, in protecting activists in certain countries? Why wasn't, why wasn't the State Department working with telecomics in real ways to help do, deploy those services? And we're starting to see that a little bit. We're starting to see some interesting experiments in that but that can probably be scaled. How can we learn from their behavior, and how can we enable certain behaviors that we see as positive? 
That doesn't get around the fact, though, that other actors using those same technologies are going to be doing things we think are negative. So I think we have to avoid that temptation to then shut down the network, to control the network, right? Instead, I think we need to offset the negative with enabling more positive. That's the only way I see out of it, other than breaking the internet, which is, which is a really real possibility, right? A lot of people are talking about that. Hi, my name is Rupinder Mangat. Uh, my question, I suppose, uh, deals a little bit with the question that was just asked, but where does that leave the public in terms of, you know, we have an election coming up. What guides our decision making in terms of, um, are we guided by our fear that there's a war or terror on, terror on mm -hmm. so we need to worry about, um, you know, we should allow all the surveillance because it's keeping us safe, yeah. or, do we all have to take that risk? And how do we actually communicate to communicate that intent to, you know, we're willing to take the risk, stop invading our privacy. How do you communicate that risk to the government well, or yeah, the states? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough challenge. And I think ultimately we know that on mass, Western societies have been incredibly willing to, for exactly those reasons, to support these policies. Now, that willingness has gone down the more we've learned about them which is interesting, right? The more we know about these technologies, the less, uh, these programs, the less, the less we support them. And particularly, the more we learn about what they are capable of for oneself personally, against oneself personally, the more, the more we push back against them. The, the problem here though is, I mean, the, de the democratic problem, one of the problems with the democratic pushback against this is that I would argue a lot of the consequences of, of surveillance um, is, is the removal of this space of dissent that privileges actors on the periphery of society um, or that threatens actors on the periphery of society. And so this is why the idea that if you have nothing to hide, then why do you care has such resonance because with the vast majority of people, um, this isn't a concern. But for society, it is, because we know that the people on the bounds of society, people pushing the boundaries of society, are the ones that, that are leading to social progress, that have led to civil rights change all the way through, that are holding governments to account, that are putting their legal status and their rights at risk in order to reveal things, right? Like, these are the people who are, who are, I think, marginalized in this space. And it's difficult for us to, um, to, to uh, compare the loss of that space and the loss of the rights of those people to our sense of personal security. There's a disconnect there, and not, it's difficult to know how to get around that. One way I think we'll, we'll see some pushback is when these sorts of systems start to be used retroactively to force people to do things. Um, this is what we've, we've started to see in the activists and the journalistic community in the leaking world, is that the power of a lot of these capabilities isn't that they'll capture things in real time. Yes, there are systems that are trying to flag behavior in real time. But the real power and the real consequence of these collection efforts is that we'll be able to go back retroactively and find patterns of behavior, find relationships that can be used as leverage in the future. And if that starts to happen as it, in a more widespread way, as it has with journalists in the United States, as it has with leakers and whistleblowers, as it has with activists who are in jail, um, then I think there could be more pushback. But but it's not it hasn't happened yet. Should I take another one up here? Um, how do we form policy surrounding predictive governance technologies with evolutions happening so quickly? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a real challenge and it's a challenge not just for governments, right? These, these algorithmic systems are evolving really quickly and this technology and capacity is evolving really quickly. I mean, look at Look at the way, just take the news industry, for example, step away from government and the challenge of evolving government, or ch challenge of evolving government in this space and holding these algorithms to account. Look at how quickly these capacities are changing the media space and um, the way the Facebook algorithm basically controls a huge piece of the, of the economic system in the news industry and that can change on a dime, it can change overnight. And we know that whole companies and swaths of the media ecosystem disappear every time that, that algorithm changes. And this algorithm is constantly learning and it's constantly evolving. And it's evolving and learning with the interests of Facebook in mind. The Google algorithm is evolving with the interests of Google in mind. And this is, this is a challenge, right? This is a challenge for anyone else, whether it's 
governments or companies who are engaged on top of those platforms. So how we hold algorithms to account, I mean, this is really tricky. We, um, we did a uh, part of a project, and I worked, I, before this worked at a, um, at a research center at the Columbia Journalism School, looking at the ways technologies were changing journalism. And a team of computer scientists did this project to try and black box algorithms. So you, you figure out all the inputs that are going, you test all these inputs going into an algorithm, and then you test what comes out, and you try and figure out, like, unpack what that algorithm might be in order to hold it to account. And they call it a algorithmic accountability journalism. And it's, and it's taking off, there's a lot of people doing this now, because algorithms are such sources of power in our society, and we're not holding them to account sufficiently. But how do you do this if the algorithm is, is classified? How do you do the algorithm is driving a drone program that you don't have access to anyway? So there's a, there's, a, there's a real challenge there. People have talked about having algorithmic ombuds people inside these companies that you can, you can plea to to, um, to look at how you might be wronged by a corporate algorithm. And maybe we need that in governments as well. Maybe we need algorithms to be open to FOIA requests. Uh, the nature of algorithms in governments to be, nature, to be open to FOIA requests. Um, I don't know. I don't think we've thought it through yet. Yeah. I was interested to observe that the founder of Palantir was supposed to have been libertari libertarian. Mm -hmm. He's now a billionaire, and every client at the seminar you went to was from the government. Yeah. So I'm wondering, are you noticing that certain organizations and governments are finding a common cause? Y yes. Um, now, I mean, it's, it used to be you could talk about Silicon Valley companies as, as having a set of common characteristics and ideologies, and that was certainly the case in the 90s in the first tech boom, and, and, and after as well, in the startup, in the emergence of these, um, these new companies, these recent round of companies. Um, but I think it's pretty clearly the case that some of them have gotten to a scale where they're intersecting, intersecting significantly with spaces of government, government power and government regulation, right? So if, uh, if Google is getting into the car business and Facebook is in the media space and the telecom space, they are now directly in the space of, go of, of national governance and international governance. So this, this sort of, this, this idea that they will replace governments is, is I think being mitigated or moderated by the degree to which they need governments to, to, to grow. Um, they need government regulation to grow, certain government regulation to grow. They need act positive engagement with governments. Um, so yeah, there, there's there's certainly that. There's an opportunism there. There's a scale issue that when you scale to that level, you you bump up against the state in different ways. Um, now, does Peter Thiel still is he still a techno libertarian? I don't I don't know. I don't, he still wants to build an island off of San Francisco that is outside of national law where startups can be based, right? So, so there's that still happening. Um, how that fits with his security contracts, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. A few quick comments before we adjourn. First of all, thank you, Taylor, uh, for your lecture this evening. You showed us how uh, new actors are disrupting uh, traditional norms of state power, and you prescribed a course of action for states to engage and reimagine uh, their activities in this area, um, in, that, in that tension between democracy and surveillance, or between uh, liberty and, and security. Uh, these are big thoughts, big issues, and uh, they're clearly governance challenges. So it's clear that you, uh, with your insights and expertise at the intersection of international affairs and digital media, uh, will be a real asset to the CG team. Thank you for joining CG. And also, more immediately, you've given us and our public audience here at CG and online a lot to think about tonight. And so for those uh, remarks, we uh, thank you very much. I'm pleased to say, and I had to just run out and check to make sure the books arrived here, but I'm pleased to say that we now have uh, your books available for sale outside, and so for those of you who'd like to purchase a copy of Disruptive Power, you can do so outside and have it signed by the author, which greatly increases its value uh, for only $32.50.
and, uh, and, and uh, Taylor will be there to sign those. An edited vi video of this evening's uh, live webcast will be posted to the CG website and uh, we'll post a blog where you can also add your own comments if you wish. And in the coming weeks, we invite you to join us for three more public events here in May at the CG Auditorium. Uh, next Wednesday, May 6th, we invite you to join us for a lecture with McGill University economist Chris Reagan for his talk on breaking climate inertia, a radically practical approach. On Thursday, May 21st, we welcome Carleton professor and former Canadian ambassador Michael Bell to discuss liberal attitudes and Middle East realities. And then the month finishes out with a lecture on Wednesday, May 27th by John Fullerton, president of the Capital Institute. He'll speak to us about reimagining capitalism. So be sure to register online for the CG Events newsletter for information on these and all of our other upcoming events. Thank you for joining us this evening and have a safe journey home. <laughs>